Good morning. Good to see everybody today. It's a great day to come worship the Lord, and we're glad that you are with us. We do have some guests with us, and if you would, please fill out a guest card. Leave that on the pew as you leave, and we'd be happy to send you a little thank you note. If you have not gotten a communion cup, please raise your hand, and we'll provide you with one. All righty. As we begin our worship today, I'm going to read a few verses from Psalm 34. And this psalm is entitled, The Happiness of Those Who Trust in God. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us extol His name together. I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him, and delivers them. Let's worship together. Eric. Good morning. Our first song this morning will be Blessed Jesus. Mm. Blessed Jesus, come to me. Soothe my soul with rays of peace. As I look to you alone, fill me with your love. Mountains high or valleys low, you will never let me go. By your fountain let me drink, fill my thirsty soul. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Blessed Jesus, come to me, Jesus. At your feet, let me touch your nail-scarred hands, Jesus. Glorious, marvelous grace that rescued me. the Lamb who died for me, glorious, marvelous grace that rescued me, holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Before our first prayer this morning, we'll sing Living by Faith. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From our home safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. 
Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From our harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Good morning. Let's bow our heads as we go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we humbly come before thy presence this morning, thanking you for this opportunity to come together that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. We come, Father, with a humble spirit, asking that you will shower us with your grace we pray, Father, that you will help us to open our hearts that we might allow your light to shine within. To the extent that our thoughts will be pure, our speech will be sound, to the extent that we will give you the praise and give you the honor that's due your high and holy name. Father, we thank you for all things this day. We thank you for life and a reasonable portion of health and strength. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus and the love that he showed us when he died on Calvary's tree, showing his love for all of mankind. And here we are today, Father, saying thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus. Father, we just pray that you will be with us this morning as we go into this worship service. We ask a special prayer upon the preacher this morning that you will bless him. Allow him to recall all those things that he has studied, that he might break unto us the bread of life to the extent we, that we might apply your word to our lives and live better for you today than we did yesterday. We ask that you will forgive us of our shortcomings and our many, many imperfections that we have because we're human. We think things that are contrary to your word. We say things sometimes that we should not say. But, Father, we ask that you will forgive us this day. Bless us and have mercy upon us. Allow your mercy and your grace to reign in our lives, so much so that people will not see us, but they will see Christ Jesus who lives within us. Oh, Father, we just ask that you will be with us and guide us and keep us. Bless those, Father, that we are duty-bound to pray for as members of the Lord's Church. Be with the sick and afflicted. Be with the motherless and the fatherless, the widow and the widower. Be with the hungry and the homeless, those who have no jobs. We ask that you will send a special blessing into their lives this day. Help them, the Father, because of the things that is happening in this world today are just terrible. There's so much confusion, so much distrust. And so, Father, we lean upon your everlasting arms this morning because we have no place else to go. And we just trust, Father, that you will keep us in the hollow of your hand and help us and build us up on all sides. Oh, dear God, we just ask that you'll continue to bless us and have mercy upon us. As we further wait the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it is our earnest prayer and our plea to you that you will help us to be the people that you would have us to be, that we can continually walk up the King's Highway holding up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. No matter what happens on all sides, we will always be able to say, we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Bless us this day and have mercy. For we ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Let the church say, Amen. Before we participate in the Lord's Supper, uh, we're going to sing, And Can It Be? Mm -hmm. And 
then can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me who scorned his perfect love. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? You left your Father's throne above, so free and infinite your grace, emptied yourself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me. Boldly I come before your throne to claim your mercy immense and free. No greater love will e'er be known for all oh my God it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Good morning. You know, when I think about the Lord's Supper, I always think of a a cleansing, a renewal, a refreshing, and that's what I pray about uh, during each prayers and between the, uh, the bread and the fruit of the vine. Just the refreshing and the cleansing that uh, what Christ did for us uh, makes how it makes me feel. I know some of you, and probably all of you, when you hear a song, something you haven't heard in a while, it takes you maybe back 10, 20, 30 years to a specific place, a specific memory. Uh, and that happens every once in a while. You don't know, hadn't thought about those things in years. Same thing with this scripture, 1 Peter 2.24. For some reason, it took me back about 55 years. I remember this experience uh, very clearly because it was very traumatic. We, uh, I lived in Dunellen from, um, from after I was born until about five years old. So I was four or five years old when this happened, but uh, I could ride a bike at four or five years old. It was a girl's bike, you know, where they had the bars like this. I could get in there and uh, paddle. The, the seat came up, hit me about the middle of the back. So that's about how small I was. Uh, no shoes, no shirt. We were always in shorts back then and I always never had any shoes on. But I would always follow, follow the older kids around the neighborhood. So the Rainbow River was, wasn't very far from our house. I mean, back then it probably seemed like miles. It's probably three or four blocks now. But I would follow the older kids around. So I followed them down to the river one day. And we got down to the river. 
And I remember a cutout, there was a seawall, there was a cutout where it looked like a boat uh, was. It looked, it looked like it was 20 feet away, but it was, you know, when you were a kid, it maybe was four or five or six feet. And there was a ladder, and it looked so refreshing, it was hot, it was cool, and it looked so much fun. And all the big kids, they started jumping in. Well, I thought I would too. Problem was, I didn't know how to swim. And it's very vivid because it's very traumatic. Uh, they jumped in, I jumped in, of course I went straight under. And, and I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was over my head, so to speak, because I was over my head. Uh, by the time I thrashed and splashed and thrashed, and I made my way to the, to the ladder, by the grace of God, I was, I was saved that day from, from drowning. I can't imagine how I got it, but I got off, got off that la- got up the ladder, got on my bicycle, and I went home. There, I was. Uh, I don't think I ever told my parents about it, but I remember it so vividly that I was, I was in the water and I had to get out, and it was a bad place. Um, and that's what sin is to us today, and that's what the problem we have in this life, where. Sin looks so good sometimes. It looks refreshing. It looks fun. And sometimes we get over our heads. And we need to recognize that. And that's why we're all here. Because we recognize we've been over our heads in sin. And we want out. And we don't want to be back there. And it was traumatic. And that's why God came. He came through Jesus uh, to save us from the sin of this world. And now that we recognize what sin is, we don't want to be in it anymore. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseers of your soul. And that's what we're here for. We want to save our souls. We want to be eternally in heaven. Eternity, I think, last time I checked, is a very long time. So we want to be with God. We want to be in heaven. And we want our families to be in heaven. So when we get out under, when we find ourselves underwater, Jesus will save us. And he'll always take us back. He'll always give us a ladder. And by the grace of God, he can pull us out. So let's give thanks right now for what he did for us, that no matter what happens in our lives, he will save us. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your body that was given to save us from the things that we can't save ourselves from. We just thank you so much for the plan of salvation and thank you for this bread that represents your son's body that died for us. Help us take it in a well-pleasing manner to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Dear Lord, this fruit of the vine represents your son's blood that's shed for us, that we'll always be in your fold, that you'll forgive us for the things that we've done. Thank you for sending him so we have a a way to get to you. We pray that we take this in a manner well-pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now is normally time that we uh, pass the uh, collection plate. Uh, <clears throat> we're no longer doing that for, the, for this time. We have some collection uh, um, boxes with the back of the, um, back of the uh, auditorium on the left and the right. There's also an online giving. It's called Giveify. If you haven't, want to or choose to go through the internet, you can give that way as well. Uh, let's give thanks for the things we have and the blessings that we have. Lord, we thank you so much that uh, you have blessed us far beyond what we deserve. We thank you for what you've given us. You give us everything that we need, Lord. And help us not be greedy because we know that you will take care of us. We ask that uh, this offering to you today will be pleasing and that we'll, the elders will take this money and you will bless their thoughts and minds and we will take care of the needs and the things that you want us to take care of. In Jesus' name, amen. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to For our lesson this morning, we'll sing, Where He Leads, I'll Follow. Let's be standing as we sing. Mm. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is and pattern for me. Where he leads I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads I'll follow, Follow Jesus every day. Late are the tender love Jesus has shown. Sweeter any love that mortals have known. Kind to the erring one, faithful is he. He the great example is and pattern for me. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. List to his loving words, come unto me. Weary, heavy laden, there is sweet rest for thee. Trust in his promises, faithful and sure. Lean upon the Savior and soul is secure. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day.
Well, good morning. 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 It's good to get, well, better be quiet, y'all. <laughs> it's nice to have it off to be able to talk and smile and see you and uh, all of those things. But uh, it's great to be with you. Great to have you here. And guests, we're thankful that you have come our way. Um, if you're not aware of it, you probably read your uh, news and notes or your bulletin, and you know that Jody and Melissa are uh, celebrating their anniversary. I'm not sure which number, but they are out of town, and that's the, I don't want to say the, well, I'm filling in for him. He is, he is out of town, and I'm sure they are in, enjoying themselves as they are together to celebrate that union, which is a great thing. But this morning, I want to share with you some things that uh, I've been thinking about, because in our time that we're in, we have, uh, you know, the, um, it's been hard sometimes, but I don't want us to ever forget what the Word of God does for us. I don't want us to ever forget the Word of God is not just meant to educate us. Educate us about God, where we came from, and all of those other things that it tells us. It's not just meant to save us. It's not just meant to provide for us a direction of which we're going and where we will go. And I hope that we understand that, but it also is given and written and hoped, studied about, so that we will take a look at it and use it to be able to change ourselves. But as, as we have already mentioned, sin is prevalent everywhere. And it is a tough thing to deal with. I want you to think with me about a classic book uh, that was written many years ago, but it is a classic from the standpoint of, uh, it's just one of the old favorites that they used to uh, read stories to children, and that was Alice in Wonderland. And it's not that I want to talk about Alice in Wonderland, but I want you to realize in that story there's something that is so true. We find this young girl running down, uh, going through life full of adventure, and we find Alice going down a rabbit hole. And when she gets down in that rabbit hole, she is walking along and she comes upon a cat, a Cheshire cat. And she, for some reason, stops in that journey of that book and she asks for advice. And the advice she asks, ask for, would, would you play, please tell me or help me out and tell me which way I ought to go? Help me out with that. Tell me which way I ought to go. Uh, and the cat, of course, responds as somebody giving directions would, where do you want to go? And her response is, in that book, I really don't care much where I go. Well, if you don't care which way you're going or what you're doing, it really doesn't matter which road you take. The Word of God is very plain and simple when it says and tells us directly in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, and verse 13 through 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and that will be the way that you will go. The narrow way, few there will be that find it, but the broad gate is very wide open. You know, so when we begin to think about the direction of our life, and we think about what the Bible does for us in studying God's Word, I want you to consider with me some things that we can find in God's Word. I want to begin this morning by some words that we can find in the book of Haggai. And I hope you'll take the time to turn there if you have your Bible. Go to the book of Matthew, go back three, three books in um, the Old Testament, go backwards, and then you will find the book of Haggai. And we will find that the book of Haggai, and I want to suggest to you, the book of Haggai is really a very contemporary message. It is one that uh, puts first things first. It doesn't put, I mean, it gets right to it. This is the most important thing. 
And the word of God came to Haggai the prophet, and he put, told them to put the first things first. And you know, it, uh, the people are a little bit like us. They agree that God is primary. God is paramount in our life. God should be served first. But I want you to know as we look and reflect on this uh, reading and talk about some things from that book, <clears throat> that apparently wasn't so because that's not the direction they went. We will notice in, the, in there that uh, they weren't acting like that was the most important thing. And the thing about studying a minor prophet like this, the challenges that the children of Israel face. And you know that, uh, you know, one of the primary things we can do as a Christian as we move forward in life is always put God first in our life. Help Him be the one that directs our footsteps. Help Him be the one that uh, we turn to and look to and understand that's the way that that needs to go and that's the way that that needs to be. But the book of Haggai tells us some very interesting things. And it is something that we need to think about. There was a sign on a, construct, uh, on a highway and it said, the warning was this. It said, uh, slow down, men working ahead. And as you drove past that sign and noticed that, the next little sign said, we hope. And I want to be honest with you. That's what God thinks. God is hoping that we're doing the things that he has asked us to do. I think that was good to get a driver's attention. Not only is there construction ahead, but we hope the people are working on it. And many of us have driven through construction and seen that that isn't necessarily the case. <clears throat> in the Word of God, in the book of Haggai, what I want you to reference today, and I want us to see together, is found there in the book of Haggai, chapter 1, and verses 5 and verse 7. Notice with me as I read for you. Um, he warns them about the time had come for them to be about doing what he had asked them to do. They had been brought out of that Babylonian captivity. And they had had the opportunity uh, to, uh, you know, it's like 550 B.C. And they went... And that's before Christ was coming, and they had gone, and they had started the work. And this all took place about 15 years after the captivity. And they began to re rebuild the temple of God there in Jerusalem. And as the rebuilding's going on, all of a sudden, they had not completed the tasks. They went about their daily business. They went about doing the things that they enjoyed and the things they wanted to do. So it got to be a little bit of an issue, and so God sends Haggai, and you'll notice in verse 5 and verse 7, he repeats it twice, and I think that's important for us to understand. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, in verse 5, consider your ways. And he goes on to tell them about the things that they have put forth effort into, and all that is going on and begins to trouble him. And he says, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And he says it, he repeats it again in verse 7. Well, I want to suggest to you that after these 15 years and the temple, the place where God was to dwell, was still sitting in ruins because they had not finished it, I want you to consider with me four things as we talk about considering your ways from the book of Haggai. The first of those, I, God wanted his people to consider their indifference toward God's work. I don't know how you feel about the indifference towards God work, God's work that we notice here among them. But you know, when a person begins to get apathetic and a person gets to a point where indifference enters their heart, well, I'll get around to it. I know I've used it as an illustration before, but I had a young man that I had in high school many years ago, and we were talking about learning lessons the hard way, and he said, yes, I had to learn a lesson the hard way. My dad made me mow the yard the same day three different times. And the reason he had to do it, because he had been asking him week after week, son, get this job done. 
And so I ended up calling the kid in my class Terry three times. Because his dad raised it as high as it would go and made him mow the yard with a lawnmower. And then he dropped it down. You know how you set those wheels a little bit and made him mow it again. And he dropped it down again and cut it where he wanted to cut it. Now the whole point I'm trying to say or share with you is the fact of he was told to do something, but he had an indifferent attitude about it. I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it when I want to. I will get that accomplished. Believe me, the job will get done, but I've got other things to do right now. So that father taught Terry a very good lesson. I believe in my mind that he was uh, taught a very good lesson. This is how Israel acted during the time of Haggai. That's how they acted. They acted indifferently about it. They were about doing their thing. Doing what they wanted to do. He even calls them out on it. And I'm not going to take the time to share all the things that the Word of God had to say there by that prophet. But he tells them, listen, you need to be about the work of God. You don't need to have this kind of attitude about it. Now, I know that you and I can say, well, listen, we've been, uh, 2020 has been tough. We've been uh, kind of isolated since uh, February. Absolutely, we have. But what is our attitude about evangelism? You know, are we indifferent about that? Well, that's somebody else's job. That's somebody else's way to figure it out through all of these different uh, ways that we're doing it. Like right now, people at home listening to me speak. And they're able to see that. Is that somebody else's deal only? I mean, is our attitude indifferent about evangelism? I wonder if my attitude about the things God's required of us to do, how my attitude is. I know what Matthew 28, 19 says. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Are we feeling a little bit indifferent about that? Is our attitude such that, hey, listen, that's what we hired Jody to do. That's what the elders are do, to do, all of that kind of thing. They're the ones that need to be doing all this other. We've got other mission. Listen, each and every one of us need to have the attitude. God has said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he didn't put anybody's name beside it. A Christian is to do that. We have got to be able to get that accomplished. How you're going to do it, I can't answer that. But you're very capable and talented people, and you do a wonderful job already of spreading great cheer and setting a great example and a way of teaching people. But their attitude was one of indifference towards God's work. Rebuild the temple. I'll get around to it after I finish my own business. You don't understand. I'm locked up in things of my own house. He goes on to talk about the paneled houses they had. And so I wonder about that. I also want you to think with me just about something that would affect us, you and I. Restoring lost souls. Restoring lost souls. You know, I think that so often you and I need to uh, think about our attitude toward that. And I'm not saying that we need to and we're able to walk right up, but there are ways to communicate with people that we long to hug again and long to see, each and every one of us. Don't be indifferent about that. Get that accomplished in your own sweet way or the way that you can handle doing that. And it'll be something for us to really consider. And then I want you to consider with me the book of Second Peter. And as we look at Second Peter, think about what it says there about our spiritual growth and how important that is. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Very important that we think about that. The book of Revelations tells us about some that became indifferent because of their attitude. Uh, the Word of God comes, the church of Ephesus. What did he say they did? They lost their first love. Listen, I'm worried about you. Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, red letters, if your Bible's like mine, he tells us the church at Ephesus had some problems because they lost their first love. And then in Galatians 6, 1, 1 and 2, as I've already mentioned. So I want us to realize our indifference towards God's work. God's work needs to be handled. You know, we need to also, when we think about 
those things that those people faced in that day and time, I want you to know that uh, he wanted them to consider their misplaced priorities. Now, I don't know how you feel about priorities, but uh, I know there's something that affects us, each and every one of us. But in this case, I want you to notice their priorities if you're still in Haggai 1. Upon their return to Jerusalem, they allowed the neighboring enemies to discourage them and dissuade them from doing it. Let me tell you something. Satan's working all the time. He's got us separated. He's got us isolated through this virus. And we've got a lot of stuff going on in the world today. You know, uh, but we're the spiritual temple today. You know, we need to be about, and as we think about the things that we need to do, be, be about serving one another. We need to be about encouraging one another and looking after each and other. But we have misplaced priorities about that because the, the children of Israel did in that time. Their priorities was placed solely on themselves and what they had going. And so it was one of those deals that they had to face themselves and it gets to be quite an issue when we let priorities get out of focus God has given us very much work to do there is a lot of things that we need to accomplish and if we're not careful we will neglect handling what God has told us to do just like they did we need to always make sure that we're putting God's work first but the God wanted those people in that day, when he said, consider, my, consider your ways, he was talking about their misplaced priorities. They moved it somewhere else. They took it away from God. And then Matthew 6, as you all know, one thing that we can lock in on is if we are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we will be about doing the right thing. Our priorities will be correct. I want you to think with me, uh, excuse me, I moved ahead and I didn't need to, but uh, how they handled discouragement, but what I wanted to share with you when we began to talk about priorities, they are an amazing thing in our lives. You know, misplaced priorities, when we think about them, I don't know how big you are on the Wild West or any of those kind of things, but when you go back in some of the archives that they have found, you know, here's... Here's something I want to share with you that I found that I think is very interesting. In a museum in Deadwood, South Dakota, there was a prospector that left this note behind, of course, at his death. It says, I lost my gun. I lost my horse. I'm out of food. The Indians are after me, but I've got all the gold I can carry. That's somebody that has misplaced their priorities. They've forgotten about the things that were most important, I would think, and have misplaced them another place. So that's not too good a thought process for us to have. But misplaced priorities, when we begin and we look at Haggai and see what began to be very important to them, it is very interesting. So then, whoa, sorry. Sorry. Hmm. Looking for some water. I'm sorry. Uh, I want you to think about how the people handled their discouragement. They were very discouraged in all the things that came their way. They were very discouraged and they begot, began to get distraught. And uh, they knew that in reading and knowing something about the former glory, even the question is asked, who among you remember the glory of Solomon's temple? So right away in their mind, they're saying, we'll never get back to that. We'll never get back to that. And so when we begin to think about hand, how they handled discouragement, and these people handled discouragement, I just want to ask the question to you, in the book of Ezra, chapter 4 and verse 4, we know about the enemies. We're going to keep them from getting it accomplished. And there in Haggai, chapter 2 and verse 4, that was happening. So uh, when you're discouraged, I want to ask you what we need to do when we are discouraged. 
When we are discouraged, there are some things that we need to think about. When we get depressed or down and I can't get it accomplished, I'm a little indifferent about God's attitude. But uh, Haggai chapter 2 and verse 4 gives us, through verse 5, some things that we need to do. The first of those, it says, is we need to take courage. And the one thing that we don't ever need to do is quit working, as these children of Israel did. We need to keep working. We need to remember the presence of God is around us. It is everywhere. And it covers us up. And God will never let us go out there on our own. Matthew, in the book of Matthew, he says, Lo, I'm with you always. And that's exactly where we are with God. Remember the presence of God. And the one thing that we can find there in Haggai and we can see in our own lives, listen, this thing is a trial for us. This isolation, being away, not being able to hug on one another, being able to meet other places other than just here in our limited area that we can be in. I mean, all of us miss that. Every one of us miss that. And it is a hard fact of being as encouraging, as loving, and all the things we want to do. But I want to assure you, just like he told them there, better days are coming. Better days are coming. And so God wanted his people to perceive and know about their need for having patience. Sometimes we get impatient with things that we know are headed our way. You know, I think about the glory of God, what God has gone and sent his son to build for us and provide for us. I have gone in John 14, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And there you will be at the end of your life. That's a long way off, but I'm going to tell you, sometimes it takes a patient walk to get there. Avoiding the discouragement, keeping priorities straight, all the other things that are discouraging along the way, but there is a need for patience in our life, and I hope there will be in yours as well. Haggai has a lot of good things to say for us, a lot of good things to direct us in, a lot of good information for us to think about because these were children of God. As Brother Vent said this morning, you know, we've left that bondage of sin. We have the blood, the body of Christ to remember weekly. And we have left those things behind. And I'll tell you, that's where we are today. So I ask you in closing, do you need to consider your ways? I want you to think about it from the standpoint of considering your ways and where you are today. I think we need to have a vision of our destination. That keeps us locked in. You know, try driving down the road without looking to where you're going or having some idea of where you're going. Or how lost you can get if you go without a map or without a GPS. It's kind of tough. But something just as simple and You've got to have a vision of our destination. I want you to know also that regardless of how things have been in our lives and where we are in our life, that what we do today is a step in a direction, either forward or backward. None of us ever stay the same. You've hear, heard that so many times spiritually. We've either got to keep moving forward or we're going backward. And I want to suggest to you that daily chases, we, uh, daily, excuse me, choices we make are not easy. They're not easy. Because there's always something battling you. I think about Satan and the involvement he has in our country today. There's racial tension. There's economic tension. There's political tension. All the tensions that build up and the step that we take in whichever direction we go these choices are not easy to make sometimes. But I'll tell you, spiritually, if we're putting God first, will be a great choice that we make. But thank you for your attention today. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you some thoughts that I've had from the book of Haggai. And I hope that this will have been beneficial to you. So if we have one here today that possibly has been misguided in their steps. The steps have taken you in the wrong direction. You know, there's a path we get on. Straight is the way, it says. Broad is the way. 
But if you have found yourself drifting over that line, that fine line, and moving toward the broad things of life and away from the Word of God, I pray that you will make a change today. But also at the same time, be aware of the fact that God has provided for us salvation through His Son, Jesus, with understanding what He has done for us in being crucified on the Christ uh, cross and buried in that grave, raising again and living forever. The blood of Christ can take away everything we've been in error in our life. If we can help one today as Brother Eric leads us, will you stand with me and let's sing. I've been crucified with Christ my Lord. I am dead to sin through His precious blood. I've been raised to life in the Son of God. By faith I walk with Him. I live for the One who died. I live in Him who was crucified. I live, and yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Once a slave to sin, now redeemed in Christ, renewed each day through His sacrifice. By faith not guilty, but if I'd set free to walk with him, I live for the one who died. I live in him who was crucified. I live and yet not I. But Christ who lives in me, yes, he lives, though reason cannot see eternal life in his will for me, that my steps are sure where the Spirit leads. By faith I walk with him. I live for the one who died. I live in him who was crucified. I live and yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Thank you, Wayne, for that fine lesson. Once again, thank you all for being here today. If you've not gotten an announcement sheet, please pick one up before you leave. I do not have any additions to the prayer list, thank the Lord, but we do have a number on there, so please remember all of them in your prayers. Uh, I do have a card from the Ernst family. Thank you for the, call, for the calls, cards, meals, and words of comfort in the loss of my mother and it is such a blessing to have a wonderful church family like ours. Gary and Sue Ernst and Lynn Birch. Now put this on the bulletin board out in the hallway. I do have one more announcement. You know, last week we announced that we would be going to a different schedule for worship. As your shepherds see things, our main job is to see to the spiritual needs of the Christians here at Central to teach, to guide, and to prepare this flock to meet the Lord at the end of our time on this earth. At times like these, with this COVID-19 pandemic among us, it is sometimes difficult to judge when or how much we should meet together in person as the body of our Lord. We announced last week that our schedule of services would be modified on August the 30th. Those plans were made in June when we believed the pandemic was tapering down. As you know from local newspaper and television reports, the number of cases is still on the rise. After talking with our medical consultants, including Dr. Oliver, 
we have come to, con to the conclusion that the danger from this disease is still too high to return to our regular schedule. In fact, the local medical community believes that the rate of infection will go up considerably as schools open back up and children get together in those facilities despite recommended precautions. For that reason, the elders have decided to retain the same schedule we are now on for worship and meeting together. There are two exceptions to that. Number one, we will go ahead with small groups on Sunday afternoons and evening for those who want to be involved. All groups will meet here at the church building, spaced throughout the afternoon with social distancing. And number two, we will be having Wednesday night Bible class for families together in either of two classes, again, social distanced. So our schedule will be as follows. Worship Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. No Sunday morning Bible classes. Small group Bible studies for those who are able throughout Sunday afternoon and evening. And that will begin September the 13th. Wednesday night Bible class at 7 p.m. with just two classes, no separate children's classes. It'll be similar to our present summer series, except more of a classroom Bible study. And of course, Thursday morning Bible class at 10 a.m. So pl please disregard what is printed in the bulletin. The shepherds apologize for making decisions and then, then changing our minds. We're just concerned for the spiritual health of everyone here and urgently hope and pray that this pandemic will soon go away. We will stay on this schedule until December when we will reevaluate the situation. Please keep us, your shepherds, in your prayers, as well as all of our members, some of which have not been able to be present with us for at least six months. Of course, include all of our sick, and those undergoing cancer treatments and surgeries, and pray that the Lord will end this pandemic quickly. We encourage you to keep in touch with those of our members who cannot attend. Phone calls, letters or notes, front yard visits, any and all of these will encourage others as we get through this pandemic together. Thank you. Before we close, we're going to sing, I'm going to wake up in glory. When all of this life on earth passes away, we'll have a home on high. We will see our great Savior there calling us home to join him up in the sky. I'm going to wake up in glory someday when troubles have all passed away. Join all the saints up there in that bright mansion fair on that triumphant day. Just think of the sights we'll see when we get there after we've run this race. Shining brighter than all the rest, we'll see our Lord who gave us his saving grace. I'm going to wake up in glory someday when troubles have all passed away. Join all the saints up there in that bright mansion fair on that triumphant day. Thank you, Brother Wayne, for that wonderful lesson. Before closing prayer, I want to read just a couple verses out of Colossians. As we look through the announcements, there's so many things to be prayerful for and to uh, be going to our Father in Heaven for prayer. Our country in general has so many concerns and things going on, but uh, so much of that could be solved if the entire world would follow these passages. I'm going to read a few passages from Colossians 3, 12. So as those of you who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, 
just as the Lord forgave you, you should, you also, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is a perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you will be called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom teaching admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart. Whatever you do in word or deed, do in the same in the name of the Lord, giving thanks through him, the God and Father. So love and kindness and forgiveness will solve a lot of problems that we have in the country right now. Let us pray. Almighty God, we're so thankful for this time that we can gather here, brothers and sisters in Christ, and come to you and worship you, worship you and study your word and praise your name. We're thankful for the many prayers that you've answered on our behalf. We're thankful for this avenue of prayer that we can come to you knowing you hear us. Father, we sometimes don't always get the answer that we want, but we know that you do hear us and we know your will be done. Father, we're grateful for the preachers and teachers and elders, deacons in this congregation. We're thankful for their dedication to you and your word. And Father, we pray that you'll continue to be with them during these difficult times that they have to make difficult decisions. We pray that you'll give them wisdom and knowledge to do so according to your word. Father, we're mindful as the young people go back to school we're mindful of this COVID-19 and the seriousness of the disease, and we pray that all will go well, that the students do need to be back in school, and they need to be getting an education. But, Father, we, do, we are concerned for their health, and we pray that you will watch over these children, be with the teachers, be, be with those who are educating them, that as much precautions and preparation can be made to keep everyone safe. We're mindful of those of this number who are sick and able, unable to be here, and we pray that the doctors and nurses and those administering to them can help them be restored to a better portion of health. Father, we're so thankful for this great country in which we live, but we are concerned of the many problems in this world, and we come to you for those answers and knowing that we can get comfort from you. We pray that you'll be with our leaders, that they may turn to you for guidance. We're thankful for our soldiers who fight for our freedoms throughout the world. We pray that you'll guide and comfort them. Father, we pray that you'll continue to be with this congregation as we 